Alexa on TMZ. Our crack team of journalists uncover the most important news. Kim Kardashian, shoes two weeks old. <gasps> oh. This is the biggest news since man walked on the moon. That's right. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. TMZ, we're really important. Jennifer Love Hewitt has cellulite. <gasps> cellulite! <gasps> Andrews, new front page. Jennifer Love Hewitt shows cellulite. She cares nothing for the world. And I am also oh offended. TMZ, your life would be nothing without us. Brad Pitt taking his kids to school. <laughs> So was he thinking he's like a person or something? Like, like he can just live life like the rest of us? <laughs> TMZ. You'll need to know this or you'll die. <gasps> now let's see if our newest member has anything to say. The standard critic, what do you got? Is it time for commercial yet? exact same instructions you give a prostitute. Now, Mr. Critic, isn't this much better than uh, mocking us on your website? Yeah, well, it was very kind of your people to get in contact with our people and let us know that you didn't like the way we represented you. It's good to know that an industry that mocks so many has such a thick, non-hypocritical skin themselves. Well, I'm just glad you took our offer to come down here for a day and see that we conduct very important, very serious work. Eh, yeah, I thought I'd take a chance and hope that one of us could learn the meaning of the word fair. Though I guess it was too optimistic to assume both of us would. Sir! Jennifer Lopez was caught with nose hairs! Take me back from my keyboard! <sighs> it's not easy representing someone, let alone their work. Maybe it's Steven Spielberg show thought that when he took over Stanley Kubrick's long-awaited fairy tale. And this was no easy task. Kubrick, director of A Clockwork Orange and 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Spielberg, pff, fuck, you all know who he is, were as far on the opposite ends of the directing spectrum as you could possibly get. Kubrick was cold and dark. Spielberg was whimsical and enchanting. Kubrick was slow and eerie. Spielberg was peppy and upbeat. Stylistically, they were practically nothing alike. The only thing the two did seem to have in common is that, at times, they surprisingly envied each other. Spielberg often longed to be that art house risk taker that Kubrick was, and Kubrick often longed to be the audience pleasing sentimentalist that Spielberg was. So when Kubrick was going through years and years and writer after writer perfecting his vision of what he would call his sci-fi version of Pinocchio, he felt he didn't have the talent to pull off the emotional heart needed and handed directing over to Spielberg while Kubrick would produce it. Spielberg thought he didn't have the talent to pull off the calculated artistry needed and handed it back to Kubrick while he would produce it. Being friends for years, they each made the argument that the other was better to direct. Until Kubrick finally caved in and said after his film Eyes Wide Shut, AI would be the next film he would do. And just to make things even more complicated, Kubrick died. So Spielberg thought it best that he bring the legendary director's masterwork to life himself, resulting in the awkward, unfocused, and confused little train wreck we all know as AI. With the style of two totally different directors being juggled, this film is about as big a mess as you can imagine. As you find yourself paying less attention to the story and instead focusing more on, is that a Kubrick move or a Spielberg move? And instead of being one artist's great masterpiece, we get visual backwash and emotional hand-me-downs to replace raw feelings and ideas. So let's see how the master of heart represents the master of art. This is AI. So we open the story about a human robot with Hollywood's own human robot, William Hurt. I love you, wife. He plays the head of a business that makes androids, and he's looking to create an android that's actually capable of love. I propose that we build a robot child who can love, a robot child who will genuinely love the parent or parents it imprints on with a love that will never end. Hmm, interesting idea, raising a lot of interesting questions. How do you program love? Can it be programmed? What's the difference between love and desire? Is there a difference? Can it be technically defined? And if it can't, can you assume you can properly create it? Does love only work if it's shared equally? 
All of these questions and more will be thrown to the eh, kind of category, as we have to establish this future that clearly exists only to justify our characters' idiot moves. For example, in this post-apocalyptic world, yeah, it's about as post-apocalyptic as a Betty Crocker commercial, pregnancy must be sanctioned to keep population under control after the ice caps melted. This is rough seeing how one couple has to keep their child frozen because he's suffering from we need to keep you out of the first 20 minutes. Itis. And thus they seem like the perfect parents to try out their new boy toy. I like your floor. This is David, played by Jesus your scary Haley Joe Osment, who's been allowed to be their son. This imprinting is irreversible. The robot child's love would be sealed in a sense hardwired and would be part of him forever. Yeah. Great plan, right? I mean, can you see anything going wrong with this idea? Ethical scarring, emotional crippling? Me? I just see playing catch. Don't imprint until you're entirely sure. Now what you might notice very quickly is that Spielberg has done a pretty decent job recreating the cinematography of Kubrick's work. It actually mirrors a lot of techniques that Kubrick has done in the past. Oh, I know Kubrick used it once in a while, so people will call me a genius when I use it all the time. What he hasn't captured, though, is the editing or the tone. Kubrick would let a lot of his shots go on for a while, building an uncomfortable mood and allowing you to enjoy the visuals or movement. But Spielberg cuts his shots just like any other movie, making his way for quirky scenes like this, which very likely would not end up in a typical Kubrick production. I think if Kubrick was directing this, we all know how this scene would go. Come play with me, mommy. But it's okay. David finally finds a way to win over his mother's affection. You would shit your pants and throw the fucking thing away? Well, not our mother. She figures that's enough to push the I love you forever button, which programs the child to never stop obsessing over her till the end of his days. Boy, if they knew that was the selling point for most parents, they'd have them laugh at even more things. Hey, David, look, keys. <laughs> A housing foreclosure. <laughs> Grass. <laughs> Tracy Morgan. Ooh, he's a keeper. So David is now programmed to love only his mom. But not his dad so much, seeing how he never refers to him as dad. Hello, David. Hello, Henry. Ouch. Might as well change his name to I'm not your sperm. David also gets a new playmate, a little toy named Teddy. Hello, Teddy. Hello, David. <laughs> Why does that create uncomfortable flashbacks? This is the end. My cuddly friend, the end. This is the end. David, Teddy is a super toy, and I know you'll take good care of each other. I am not a toy. Teddy is my slave name. You may call me Cuddly Kinte. But oh, that pesky real son wakes up and apparently is not thrilled about his robotic replacement. Doing terrible things like forcing his mother to read horribly ironic stories. His favorite being Pinocchio. David's going to love it. <laughs> but David ends up liking the story, particularly the part about where the blue fairy turns Pinocchio into a real boy a pipsqueak McPimple fuck constantly reminds him that he's not a real boy. So, fighting for his mother's attention, he tries eating spinach to convince that he is real. You will break. Exactly. Oh. Was that an observation from Teddy or a threat? I must break you. Does he eat? I'm not sure. Martin, you're provoking him. David, stop it!
Oh no, they use Photoshop smear. We need heavy duty Mario Party for this. He gets fixed up, but Schemy McWeasel bitch has yet another plan. I want a lock of Mommy's hair. I'll share it with you. And if you had it and wore it, she might love you even more. The ranger isn't gonna like this, Yogi. He tries cutting off the hair, but ends up looking like a poster child for Lizzie Borden's barber school, which ends up getting the parents concerned. If he was created to love, then it's reasonable to assume he knows how to hate. And if pushed to those extremes, what is he really capable of? And more importantly, why did not the scientists putting him together everything of this? Why is it every story where someone wants to play God, they're always like, eh, those questions will just go away. Why does nobody in movies ever think of the consequences? Consequences is consequences, as long as I'm rich. But through misunderstanding number 20, David becomes afraid of some bullies, hides behind his brother, and they both fall into the pool, resulting in his brother almost getting killed. So I guess it's finally time to bring him in and have the scientists look at a lot of these kinks going on, huh? Nope, nuke him. Yeah, no, nah, there's no other alternative. He's gotta die. Just hop in your mechanical hot dog and tell him we're taking a trip to the liquidation factory. Come on, it's an easy choice. It's not like anybody would grow attached to him with his big puppy dog eyes, innocent smile, and will to love past the end of time. I mean, Jesus, what if kids in the 90s had to get rid of their Furbies the exact same way? Teddy, no! I'm sorry, son, but you read the instructions. Once he starts malfunctioning, he has to be bludgeoned to death as violently as possible. But I love... <laughs> Oh, now don't tell me you want to see the therapist again. <laughs> Where are we going? What's for dinner tonight? Tell me about the rabbits, George. I... I have to leave you here. No. No, 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 no. You, no, you, Mommy, you, please, no, no. No, no, no I, I have to go, I have, I have to go. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. This emotional meat tenderizer to your nads is not warranted. There's a bajillion other ways around this. Reprogram him, change the settings, wipe his memory, adjust his abilities. Be more specific in your commands. Nothing about this makes any sense. I think the only way it would make even less sense is if Batman showed up and said, I pulled his brother into the pool. I didn't tell you about the world. And if his mother loved him so much, she wouldn't leave him to roam alone in this dangerous world she's sorry she never taught him about. She would know it's much worse to leave him alive knowing he'll never see her again than it is just to shut him off. I mean, come on, Spielberg. Cooper covered his tracks better than this. I mean, what human being would be so absent-minded and so cruel? Okay, people, story time. <sighs> Duty calls him. Timbe! We dedicate our lives to make sure you have none! All right, guys, go. I was digging through Leonardo DiCaprio's garbage, and I found McDonald's. Oh, you mean he eats food? Obviously, someone's in financial difficulties. Ba-da-ba-ba, -ba -ba, I'm bombing it. <laughs> Timbe! We sling what you need! Guys, I have a picture of Natalie Portman with a mustard stain on her shirt. <gasps> Shun her! We must shun her! Put that picture on the front page! The people must know! Ah! I have the power! TMV! Watch us, you dumbasses! Watch us! <sighs> Crick, what do you got? Oh, well, I uh, did find a story here that uh, Sandra Bullock... Oh! Sandra Bullock will be honored for donating $25,000 to the Warren Essen Charter High School, uh, which was destroyed in Hurricane Katrina. Oh, uh, she also opened an on-campus health clinic there as well. <laughs> you say what you want about her shitty movies, but that's pretty cool, right? I mean, that's really big of her. She looks fat. What? She looks really fat. Mr. Norton, new front page. Sandra Bullock, ballooning the blind side of her backside. <laughs> <laughs> Tiberius lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. I mean, we trend to the end! <laughs> Miss Lewis, what's wrong? I just for a second thought about doing real journalism, respecting my job, and contributing something important to people's lives. Miss Lewis, pull yourself together! <laughs> Your job is bullshit! If you don't report Emma Watson possibly having a double chin, then who will? But I... <laughs> 
to swallow your dignity and remember, you have no soul to lose. Okay, I'm good. Good. Timothy! We're cool! Really, we're cool! So we cut to what I like to call movie two, because yeah, from this point on, it is pretty much an entirely different movie, where we see Jude Law playing a prostabot. He's in trouble because he's framed for a murder by a jealous ex-lover, and thus is on the run. Because apparently, even though it's explained very clearly that none of these robots are able to have feelings, they do seem to have a need for self-preservation, and a need to form opinions, and a need to be sarcastic and a need to have distinct personalities, and a need to adapt, and a need to change, and a need to interact, and a need to survive, and a need to help, and a need to protect, and a need to fight, and a need to lie, and a need to deceit, and a need to want, and a need to desire, and a need to do just about anything a goddamn human being emotionally needs to do. But just to emphasize again, none of them have any emotional feelings whatsoever. Yeah. And Mel Gibson just drinks a little too much coffee. He does? Newsflash! <sighs> so David comes across a bunch of robot zombies. Which, if that's not a thing... Somebody make that a thing. But they see a bad moon rising, which are actually representatives of a flesh fair. A gathering of people who hate robots and take ones who are no longer owned and destroy them. Okay, I know we're trying to hammer in the whole fairy tale thing, but really, this is what we're doing for Chased by Wolves? Is this really the best you got? Because if you're going to do that, why don't you just make Little Red Riding Hood a gang on the east side with red hoodies? Just posing for the camera to show off that effect? Okay. So they get caught in a net. Yeah, apparently the super strong robot's greatest weakness is... Annette. As they drag him to the last place they want to go to. Welcome to the Kubrick Spielberg collaboration, everybody! Doesn't it look exactly how you thought it would look? Oh, the artistic majesty. Oh, the visual wonder. Oh, the... Chris Rockbot? Did you kind of shoot me over the propeller thing? Yeah, I don't need to go through it. I, I, mean, I was considering it, but I changed my mind. Okay, Mr. Spielberg, I'm not gonna act like I'm the biggest aficionado on Stanley Kubrick or anything, but I'm just gonna take a wild guess. A wild fucking guess! That Stanley Kubrick, the director of 2001, A Clockwork Orange, the shiny- HE WOULDN'T PUT A CHRIS ROBOT IN THERE! I mean, did you really think that was part of the Great Master's vision? Really? Was one of the agreements that you guys talked about in making this film for years that it cannot be made unless the essential Chris Rock bot was in there? Just somewhere? Anywhere? The whole entire thing would crumble if... Really? A Chris Rock bot? Or hell! Maybe Stanley Kubrick was a big Chris Rock fan. I mean, who knows? Maybe he could have used him in other films if he was around back then. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Damn! Open the doors. No! What's the problem? crack a lack you got to go! What are you talking about, Hal? I gotta get this part right, or I'm gonna have nothing but shitty movies for the rest of my life! Hal, I won't argue with you anymore. Uh, uh, I don't think you understand. You got to go! Hal? Hal! Uh, no. Hal! Hal! Uh, no. uh, no. I'll go in through the emergency airlock. What do you want, a cookie? I mean, it's lazy! It's so fucking lazy! I mean, what idiot would actually put- Another meeting, everyone! <sighs> you know, sometimes I wonder if Spielberg even understands what it means to represent someone fairly. All right, guys, because we have so many important topics to get out there, I thought it would be best if we select our stories a little faster. So I'm gonna hold up a picture of a celebrity. And if I think we should do a story on it, then uh, let out a collective grunt. And if you don't think we should do a story on a celebrity, then uh, just shake your head, no. That's a great idea! Yeah, we'll be able to get through more stories this way. All right.
Now that's what thought provoking news is all about, right guys? What? Back to the flesh WWE monster truck anti-gay marriage fair, when somebody thinks David shouldn't be there. You're a machine. My name is David. Impossible. Why? He looks like every other robot there, at least the ones that look human. Is it because there's never been a robot child before? 75 years at least of androids and there's never been a robot child? The Chris Rock bot was more important to make than a robot child? I'm sorry, unless he's a machine that also turns water to absinthe, I wouldn't buy him. I said let go. I'm trying. Don't let go, keep me safe. Don't let go. Save yourself. But just when it looks like David and his prostabot are about to go to Silicon Heaven, the audience finds they just can't do it. Don't make me do it! I'm David! I'm David! I'm David! Mecca don't plead for their lives! Oh really? Did you? Not hear the comedic pleads of the Chris Rock bot? I'm sorry, I know I'm dwelling, but really, what was that? So they let him go and the Prostobot follows along. His new mission? To find the Blue Fairy. Rather than the Prostobot just tell him, oh, I don't know, there's no such thing, he says the answer lies in a perverted little town known as Rouge City. They go through, uh, let's face it, the most awesome shot in the movie. and hitch a ride all the way down to PG-13 land. A place that never would have existed in Kubrick's world. That's right, all of your wildest fantasies mildly realized. Oh, look at how sort of stimulating that is. Oh, look at how kind of erotic that turns out, ish. Hey, look, that almost looks like a nipple. Almost! And because the internet apparently doesn't exist in this future, all of your questions have to be answered by a distracting Robin Dr. Wiley Williams performance. Starving minds, welcome to Dr. No, where fast food for thought is served up 24 hours a day in 40,000 locations nationwide. Question one, explain these. I thought so. But Dr. Google, it appears, doesn't seem to have the answers that David is looking for. Where is Blue? Fairy? In the garden. Vascostylus blue fairy. Blooms twice annually with bright blue flowers on a branched inflorescence. Come on, just a few years after this movie came out, we got the greatest search engines possible. And this incredible future thing can't even tell if it means a flower, a story, or whatever? God, must be the AOL of search engines. But they finally ask the right question and figure out that the blue fairy apparently is at the factory where David was created. All the way in New York City. Kind of strange office location, don't you think? Is the commute difficult for workers there? Hey Frank, going to destroyed ruin number five again? Nah, I think I'm upgrading to dangerously unstable rubble number three. You know, looking to move up in the world. But David goes inside the factory and searches for himself. Sort of. Are you real? I'm David. You're not. Yes, I am. So am I. Let's be friends. But I'm sure kind, loving David will find it in his heart to find that he's unique in his own wonderful I'm way. David! Jesus! David! I can't believe, even though I know I'm a machine, I never realized they could build another one of me. Why is so much obvious logical information left out of my memory banks? Why? But the bland bot comes in and explains that everything that's happened to him was all part of the plan. The ability to chase down our dreams. And that is something no machine has ever done until you. Until you were born, robots didn't dream, robots didn't desire unless we told them what to want. Your ability to want nothing but your mother even after you were programmed to want nothing but your mother is a breakthrough? I thought I was one of a kind. You are the first of a kind. My brain is falling out. The team is anxious to talk to you. 
I want you to wait here. I'll gather them up. Yes, after killing your robotic double, destroying the room, and looking completely brain raped, I'll leave you here completely alone and unattended. What could go wrong? Well, how about this? David throws himself off the building into the water, where, quite fucking coincidentally, he finds a statue of the Blue Fairy at an amusement park. Oh, after being guided there by a school of fish, of course. I don't know. Prostabot gets busted by authorities using a magnet, which doesn't suck up David for some reason. And David makes his way to the Blue Fairy statue, where he spends the rest of his days following a dream, hoping it'll come true. Please make me real. Even, you could argue, creating faith, possibly even a religion, thus making him much less human, but also even more human drawing his journey to a close. years later oh yeah don't act like you don't know what happens even people who haven't seen the movie know about the infamously horrible continuation of a story that everyone in the world said should not continue it would have been fine if they just left him in front of the Blue Fairy. Everyone would have said, yeah, it had problems, but you know what? It could have been worse. Well, this is the worst they're talking about. And it's not just the fact that it continues when it shouldn't, it's the fact that it gives the lamest, the schmaltziest, preschool-friendly middle finger to anyone who may have possibly liked this movie even a little. You all know what it is, but just for the hell of it, let's go over it. Aliens arrive. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry. Robots that are never clarified as robots unless you read the script. And discover David 2,000 years later frozen in ice. Yeah, apparently his circuits and programming survived all that time. The longest lasting in human creation. Just don't feed him spinach. And with their super not alien powers, they create a world for David to live in just like his home. And get this, even the blue fairy is there. You have been searching for me, haven't you, David? Now, if you still somehow managed to stay in your seat after this information was made aware to you, I urge you not to turn around because you probably noticed rows and rows of empty seats, and threatening letters written in nosebleed blood, as that was the only thing that could serve as ink at the time. Will mommy be coming home soon? She can never come home, because 2,000 years have passed, and she is no longer living. Yes, our technology only extends to blue fairy science. We can bring inanimate wood to life and give it a personality based on your memory, but the one thing that takes up the most of your fucking mind we can't materialize for some reason. We're kind of dumb not aliens that way. We can bring back other people from your time in the past. Why can't you bring back her? Because we can only bring back people whose bodies we dig up from the ice. We need some physical sample of the person. Like a bone or a fingernail. Oh yeah, because the enchanting fairy tale atmosphere is really completed with talks of DNA samples and scientific reanimation. God, a fucking blue fairy is saying this! David, do you remember when you cut some of mommy's hair? <gasps> oh, tell me Teddy doesn't have it. Tell me Teddy doesn't have it. Oh, he does, he does. Kinda sick, actually, but I won't question the motives behind a children's toy who doesn't have motives, remember? No feelings. We clarified that, uh-huh. Now you can bring her back. Your wish is my command. So, joy of joys, the... <sighs> Blue Fairy can bring Mommy back, right? Well, listen to this horse cock. Those who were resurrected only lived through a single day of renewed life. 
If we bring your mother back now, it will only be for one day. Maybe the one day. Maybe it will last forever. If you still manage to stay in your seats after this information was made aware to you, I urge you again, please don't turn around because Chances are you be seeing the hanging dead corpses of the film custodians. The owner of the theater? Hell, maybe even the people who made the popcorn. I don't know, just whoever they could find. We only want for your happiness. Then you know what you have to do. Listen, can you hear that? Go to her, David. Oh, so they already brought her back to life. They were just fucking with him by giving him the option. I mean, if he said no, would they have just Eating her or something? I found you. She wakes up in a Folgers commercial and they intend to spend the whole day together as if it was her last because... Yeah, that's the gist of it. <laughs> David had never had a birthday party because David had never been born. So they baked a cake and lit some candles. Now make a wish. It came true already. manage to stay in your seats after this information was made aware to you, I desperately urge you do not turn around and look behind you because chances are your theater is on fire. I don't know if you remember the great AI theater burnings of 2001, but it cost many moviegoers their lives. Yet the causers of the fire still got a refund. And for the first time in his life, he went to that place where dreams are born. And Teddy? Well, fuck Teddy. He's not real like David. He's just a bear. A bear who wanted to make David's dreams come true, even though he doesn't want anything technically, because he's just a machine who cares about what David wants, while not caring what David wants. Jesus, this is stupid! This is the stupidest ending you could ever give to a movie like this! I mean, by God, were you even thinking? Were you even thinking? And we all know who's to blame, right? We all know exactly who's to blame for this schmaltzy crap. Spielberg, he's the culprit. We all know it, it's got to be Spielberg. I mean, obviously Kubrick would have ended it under the water and Spielberg added that last 15 minutes. There's no other explanation. Wait, just look at it here. Just look at it here. Yeah, there you go. The writers who were originally working on AI all thought it was crazy when Kubrick wanted to bring David's mother back. What? That ending was Kubrick's idea. In fact, most of the original writers thought it wouldn't work but Spielberg did his best to work with him and get across the idea he had in mind. So, Kubrick's to blame for that ending? THE Stanley Kubrick? The Shining, A Clockwork Orange, Paths of Glory? He's the one that put together that incredibly sappy ending? Wow. Maybe in the end, Kubrick was trying to make that Spielberg movie he never could which ironically resulted in Spielberg making that Kubrick movie he never could. The film is so disjointed and all over the place, and clearly not one vision. But at the same time, bringing that vision to life, even though so many people were against it, just to make a close friend's dream come true. Maybe he understood Kubrick better than we thought he did. Maybe he understood him better than any of us did. Maybe representing a person's work and representing a person himself are more similar than we realized. Who's that guy? Oh, well that's Stanley Kubrick, sir. Kubrick. I know that name. Oh, well, you should. He directed 2001 A Space Odyssey, A Clockwork Orange, The Shining, just to name a few. And, uh, what are you looking up about him? Oh, just how Steven Spielberg and him were friends, and how he directed a movie for him after he died, and how they might have actually been closer to each other than a lot of people gave him credit for. Hmm. That sounds pretty good. Do you uh, mind if we uh, use that for the topic of this week's show? Sure, go for it.
Well, goes to show you again. Some people can, in fact, surprise you in the end. Next TMP! Where Stanley Kubrick and Steven Spielberg gave for one another? Look out, Bert and Ernie! So my research shows that these two are all over each other. How can Spielberg be all over that fat blob? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's easier to understand than half his crappy movies. Yeah. Hello, 2001? I mean, like, if I can't understand it, then that means it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> what a hack! <laughs> Hey, Craig, what are you doing? Well, you guys have opened my eyes. You've shown me that nothing is sacred. I mean, by God, if you can take Stanley Kubrick, one of the greatest directors of all time, and make a story about him like that, I have no choice. If you can't beat him, join him. <laughs> Suicides are at a new low! Well, everyone, in light of the critic's recent breakthrough, I think it's only fair that we let him go first, okay? You got some good stuff for us, critic? Oh, I do, I do, yes. I have drunken outbursts, sexual affairs, cross-dressing, some of the sauciest stuff I've ever had to record. Ooh. Well, that all sounds pretty steamy, critic. How did you get so much footage of people doing such rotten stuff? Oh, it was quite easy, actually. I just followed all of you. What? Yeah, yeah, for example, Mr. Aaron, I got some lovely snapshots of you cheating on your wife. Oh, don't laugh too much there, Mrs. Adams. You're the one he's having the affair with. And Miss Lewis, who can forget that enchanted evening that I recorded not 24 hours ago. You were amazing. <laughs> And our dear beloved boss, take a look at what I recorded when you thought you were alone in what you thought was a closed office. Yeah, not so hot when the two-week-old shoe is on the other foot, is it? But you want to know who the biggest idiot of them all is? This guy right here. Yeah all because of what he thought of this. I used to hate this movie. I mean, really despise it. I thought this was the worst representation of a director simply by choosing his opposite. But I realize now that Spielberg was going into a no-win situation. If he did it in his own style, everyone would say, oh, that's not like Kubrick at all. If he tried to mimic his style, everybody would say, oh, he's not talented enough to mimic Kubrick. But maybe it wasn't about that. Maybe it was just about bringing a man's dream to life. A dream that this man obsessed over for years and years and a really good friend didn't want to see go to waste. And even if it didn't come out that great, even if it was unfocused or cheesy, he still mimicked the director enough to show that he understood him. He still created some interesting conversations and ideas. And you know what? He fucking tried. He tried to the best of his abilities to properly represent a person who was very close to him. Which is more than I can say for anyone in this room! Maybe Kubrick would have done it better, maybe he could have done it worse. Hell, it's totally possible for a great director to make a bad film. But what nobody can deny is that Spielberg did his best to make a friend's dream a reality. And nobody, fucking nobody, can fault him for that. Yeah, well, he's still fat. <sighs> well, I guess it doesn't matter. All the world knows your evil little secrets anyway. But how do we come back from this? How do we make them forget? Well, maybe if you ask all the people on the internet over and over to forget, maybe, just maybe, your wish will come true.
please forget. Please forget. Please forget. Please forget. Well, maybe the longing for dignity is the beginning of dignity. I'm the nostalgia critic. I remember it. Please forget. And don't you forget. Please forget. I don't think it's working. Let's try something more positive.